thank you all for coming this morning. This is my first AMWA meeting, believe it or not. I've never been in, uh, in the organization. I hope not the last, right? <laughs> I've been here since Thursday, and I've really enjoyed uh, listening to all of the speakers. They've been amazing. I've especially enjoyed meeting all of the talented women among the speakers as well as the attendees, and I hope I'll get to meet more of you as till the end of the meeting. But one thing that I can say is that I'm going to be going home at the end of this meeting feeling that the future for women in medicine is bright. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, thank the American Medical Women's Association for asking me to speak, and especially a thank you to Eliza Chin, who was so helpful, and especially to Amanda Chi, who helped me with my slides. So I hope they'll be working. Okay. Well, let's see. Let's get started. A few years ago, is this the first slide? Yes. A few years ago, uh, the American College of Physician Executives, which is, has, has been rebranded as the American Association of Physician Leadership, asked me to update a monograph that I had written in 1995, which was titled Women in Medicine and Management, a Mentoring Guide. Now, in 1995, only about 19% of physicians in the United States were women. And as you might imagine, it was very difficult to find more than a few women who were in low-level or mid-management positions and almost none in top management. And that was true across the entire healthcare system, whether it was academia, government, hospitals, managed care, or corporate healthcare organizations. Wherever I looked, the situation was the same. But I finally selected 17 representative women physicians, and I asked them to write their personal stories, including how they chose medicine, why and how they transitioned to clinical to management, and what obstacles they encountered along the way. Now, it was clear from their narratives that for most of them, leadership positions had been unplanned, and that few had found role models or mentors to help guide their career paths. And there was also a consensus that a thick glass ceiling existed within healthcare that was thwarting their ability to move into more senior positions. Well, when I agreed to uh, update the monograph two decades later, I expected the situation to be significantly improved. After all, women have been entering medicine in greater numbers since 1995, so that 50% or more of the uh, students who are enrolled in many of the medical schools across the United States, including my alma mater, are, are female. Unfortunately, as I researched this, the latest statistics for the book and now for this talk, I found that women physicians are still underrepresented and underutilized in positions of power, especially at the most senior levels. Now, Barnard College President Deborah Spar, oh my, this needs to be lowered, but anyway, um, Deborah Spar has labeled the marginalization of U.S. women in senior leadership roles as a 16% ghetto. And while she's acknowledged this in aerospace, in entertainment and media, in engineering, in higher education, and Fortune 500 companies, I learned that Spar's observations apply equally to women physicians. Now, according to the latest statistics, no more than about 16% of the top leadership uh, roles in any area of the healthcare system are held by women doctors. Well, I've always believed that the narrative form is a powerful way to engage people. We tend to remember stories more than we remember data. So for, that was the reason why for the uh, updated book I decided to use the same format, and I was able this time to find 23 exceptional female physicians who've defied the odds by rising to management positions either at the top or fairly close to the top. And the title of the book is Lessons Learned, Women in Medicine and Management. Uh, stories from Women in Medical Management, sorry. <laughs> so in it, these women share their career paths from clinical medicine to leadership within academia, the pharmaceutical industry, government, hospitals, provider groups, managed care, consulting, and entrepreneurial ventures, including the obstacles and challenges that they found in balancing work, family, and personal life. Now, uh, but here are the contributors. I know it's a little difficult to read, but 10 of them are from the original monograph. I wanted to see how they had done career-wise in the intervening years. And 14 are new. Now, as you can see on the third line of this new group is Ora Peskovitz. Um, as uh, Teresa said, she is going to be our luncheon speaker. Uh, Ora was the CEO of the University of Michigan's healthcare system when she wrote the book. And now she is the senior vice president and US medical leader for Eli Lilly. She's an amazing woman. She comes in a tiny package, but I think you'll find that she's, uh, <laughs> she's a, a, a great role model, and I hope that you'll get to know her as well as obviously to hear her speak. So as I said, all of the women in the group in Lessons Learned have been successful in their careers, 
and some had made it to the top or very close, but they were still the exception. So the question is, why are women physicians still underrepresented in senior leadership positions? Well, in June of 2012, Anne-Marie Slaughter wrote a piece in The Atlantic which was titled, Why Women Still Can't Have It All. It, it instantly went viral. There were over two million readers online, and everybody started talking. And then a year later, in March of 2013, Women's History Month celebrated the 50th anniversary of Betty Friedan's famous book, The Feminine Mystique, and the rolling out of Sheryl Sandberg's book about leaning in. And at the same time, there was a controversy over Marissa Mayer, the CEO of Yahoo's memo, in which she had said that she was going to discontinue telecommuting at her company. Well, all of this brought renewed interest to the whole issue of women as leaders, and that happened not only in mainstream media, but also at kind of lit up social networking sites like Twitter and Facebook and um, LinkedIn. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of the uh, company called Rock Health. Uh, it's a really very impressive organization. It's an incubator for digital health and healthcare technology startups. And if you check out their website, virtually all of their senior leadership is, are women, except ironically for their medical director. Now, a few years ago, they surveyed women leaders, and they asked them why they thought women failed to attain the most senior roles. And the three primary reasons that they gave were lack of confidence, lack of mentors and role models, and time constraints or family obligations. And these were among the same issues that were mentioned by the uh, contributors to Lessons Learned. Well, lack of confidence is something that Sheryl Sandberg talks about in her book, Leaned In. And as a physician executive recruiter, I can tell you that I have seen uh, real differences between male and female candidates. Now, when I send a male candidate a job description, uh, and they may not have all the, or they may not have uh, all the required skills that is necessary for the position, they won't even worry that this might be a potential deal breaker. But the minute I send the same job description to a female candidate, she's going to tell me all the areas where she needs more skills or where she feels she needs more experience. Now, a quote that has often been attributed to, oops, let's see, I guess I missed, oh no, this, this goes back, sorry. A quote that has been attributed to Henry Ford uh, comes to mind here. Those who say they can and those who say they can't are both right. And I'm not talking about putting people into positions for which they're not qualified. When I send a job description to a candidate, I, I have usually vetted them enough to feel that they do have the experience and the skills necessary for the job. And I've also vetted the organization enough to feel that there may be a fit between the candidate and the organization. So it's this lack of confidence that often keeps women physicians from considering certain leadership roles. It's not that they can't do the job. It's not even that they don't aspire to these roles. On the contrary, there is agreement today that when women have the opportunity to provide management support for uh, medical practitioners, they do enjoy the job and they love uh, and they're very successful as leaders. Now certainly the women in the book reflect this attitude. They say that they opted for management as their overall career advancement. Most want to be policymakers, to have an opportunity to provide top management and support for medical practitioners, and to influence the big picture that is how groups of patients receive care, as well as the environment in which these services are delivered. <coughs> okay. The second reason that was given in the Rock Health survey for why women failed to attain more senior leadership roles was a lack of mentors and role models. And this is a very real issue. Virtually every woman in my book said that they attributed their success to finding a mentor along the way. In the Rock Health survey of women, almost half of them had no mentor, and a small percentage were able to find female mentors. The third reason given for a failure to move up is the difficulty that women find in balancing work and family. Now, I knew this was true in my generation, but I've honestly been surprised to find that it's almost as true for, for the group of younger women physicians. Despite the fact that millennial men, those who are ages 18 to the early 30s, claim to have egalitarian attitudes about family, career, and gender roles inside marriage. According to a variety of research by social scientists, these guys really don't feel the same pressures that women do. And here is a quote by a medical student recently who said, trying to fit a reproduction schedule within a growing career is always on my mind. My male peers and partner give this significantly less thought. Well, we can spend hours discussing the problems, but as someone who likes to solve problems once they're diagnosed, then the question is, how can we reduce the barriers and promote more female physicians in healthcare? So here are just a few. 
We need to showcase our successes. Let our daughters see what we can do. Show them how we can lean in. And I'm happy to say that many of the speakers here who have daughters have acknowledged the fact that that's exactly what they're doing, so that's great. We need to support reversals of, domestic, of traditional domestic roles. And that may mean encouraging your workplace to offer parental leave for fathers as well as mothers. Kathleen McCartney, who was the president of Smith College and the former dean of the Harvard School of, uh, Graduate School of Education wrote, and I quote, I have spent much of my 31 year career as a scholar arguing for family friendly policies like quality childcare, parental leave, and flexible work hours. But if we view these policy changes as supporting maternal rather than parental employment, then roadblocks for women will remain. We understand sexism when it's explicit, that is unequal pay for equal work. But we haven't acknowledged gendered cultural biases surrounding parenthood. Our implicit biases limit the aspirations of men and women alike. The solution lies in recognizing the problem. Only then will we be able to, to change our culture, end quote. And we need to eliminate those double standards that penalize women for traits and, be, and uh, behaviors that are rewarded in men, like uh, assertiveness, daring, risk-taking, and bravery. Now, if you've paid any attention to the political uh, season, and I guess it's hard not to, uh, you can see that the same media that allows men the privilege of what I'd call political passion often labels women candidates with similar characteristics as strident and shrill and a few other bleepable words. So these last two, traditional, uh, reversing the, tr the uh, traditional domestic roles and eliminating double standards require what I'd call a pushback. And that is a new way of thinking about work and leadership. That paradigm shift is not in seeing women as the problem, but the solution. That shift is in acknowledging that the playing field is not on its own level and that you must work very intentionally to make it that way. The system ne itself needs to work a lot harder to ensure that the efforts of talented women are fully recognized, valued, and rewarded. Leadership needs to be held accountable for creating as much transparency in the workplace as possible so that true talent and hard work gets its just reward. So yes, we need to lean in, but we also need to push back. And finally, we need to serve as mentors to other women, and that means building relationships at every level. I, um, at a time when, met, when uh, virtually everyone agrees that the US healthcare system, the delivery system, needs some fundamental change, I hope that this book ultimately is making the case for talented women and women, to, women physician executives who are articulate in the language of business and health policy will be among those leaders. I personally found their leadership stories of, of the women in the book inspiring. Their drive, their generosity, their curiosity and heart demonstrate the best of what women has to offer patients and the world. Now the women profiled the book are intentionally a diverse group. Some are married. Some are not, some have children, some have none, some are surgeons by training, others are primary care doctors. And while each of these women, uh, are, women physicians are unique, they work as physician managers in virtually every type of healthcare organization across the United States, their stories share some common themes. So I thought for this presentation that I would put together a compilation of some of the practical lessons that virtually all of the women uh, profiled agreed on. And I hope you'll bear with me because I'm going to have to read some of these because I went through the book the other day and found about 11 of them. Now first they say it's important to be deeply passionate about what you do. And that requires a sense of self. Making career choices is highly individual. So before deciding on a career journey or making a career change along the way, each person should do a thorough self-assessment to discern what brings them satisfaction and success. What are your expectations? Are you running from something? Or are you going somewhere? What brings you true satisfaction? Are you just looking for greener pastures? Or do you have a sense, a, really, a realistic picture of what's ahead? Understand your own learning and work style, how you interact with others, how you are perceived by others, your sense of values, and what anchors you. And ask yourself these hard questions, seeking open and honest feedback from people around you. Number two. If you really want success as a leader, you need to be willing to take risks, to grab opportunities where and when you find them. Now, most reward comes from a big challenge. So if you want to move ahead in management, you need to be able to, uh, to learn to, to take and manage risks. And that means understanding that with, with uh, <laughs> so that means that understanding that failure goes hand in hand with success. So understand that you do sometimes fail, but learn from that. 
Now, virtually all the women in the book benefit from, benefited from mentors. They may be other executives, physicians or not, friends, a coach, family members, each helping in a different way. But the most impactful mentors are the ones who will tell you what you don't want to hear. And for phys physician executives, it's very important to interact with non-physicians as well as physicians. And I would add that for non-physician executives, it's equally important to have relationships with physicians. Everyone needs to communicate and interact with people who come from diverse backgrounds, education, and training. All of the women felt that there were no major differences in the guiding principles uh, of their personal and professional lives. And they all agreed as they moved up they needed in their careers, they needed to change the vision for each new level of position. So the higher they moved in their organizations, the broader their vision had to become, and the longer the view into the future that they needed to take. That vision for the organization should inspire, they say. It should impart to all employees the belief that they can do great things. Now, leaders must be role models in their professional and personal lives, building a reputation of honesty and integrity. A leader also needs to establish a track record of tangible experiences and accomplishments. And I'm often asked about the need to get an MBA or an M MHA or other uh, advanced management degree. Well, having a business degree on your resume, even if it's from an elite school, is not sufficient to land you a job as a manager, nor is it necessarily required for a particular job, even when it might be listed in the job description, because what really counts is experience. The ability to talk the talk with an, without an objective, measurable track record won't last long, especially in this rapidly changing healthcare environment. Leaders must be committed to organizational transparency and openness. Information is power, and it needs to be shared. Hoarding information and knowledge actually reduces your influence, and I can't emphasize that enough. If there was one thing to take away, I would say that. Hoarding information and knowledge actually reduces your influence. So encourage and, and practice transparency within your team, your reports, and your organization. Being a role model and mentoring others is part of knowledge sharing, too. It's also important to show gratitude towards those who help and support you along the way. So be inclusive of others. Think the we versus I. Believe it and reflect it sincerely. A major skill for physician executives is the ability to function in a team even when you're not the leader, to navigate organizational politics, and to understand the importance of winning together. Now, no matter your age or your experience, never stop listening to those who can teach and inspire. And never stop learning, reading, observing, and trying new ways. Challenge yourself. How can I improve? How can I grow? Be insightful about your own abilities and shortcomings, and focus on your personal continued improvement. Now, at a personal level, while most of the women acknowledge that they didn't always do this, they all recommended making time to enjoy family vacations and long-lasting friendships. And you, of course, just heard that in the last speaker. Taking care of yourself realistically helps to re-energize and stay healthy. Realistically assessing time needs for various business and personal tasks is critical, they said. And they all said that they learned that they're never probably going to be able to accomplish everything on their to-do list, but that was OK. It was knowing when to say no and avoiding personal and work-related overcommitment that really helped. And finally. They felt, oh my goodness, well, the top part says never forget the patient. And they, <laughs> that physician leaders should never forget the patient. With one exception, each of the women profiled began their careers as practicing clinicians. And although most of them have given up their day-to-day -day management of individual patients as they transitioned into more senior leadership positions, it was their work as physicians first, they say, that gave them the unique perspective that, that they felt was required to be an excellent healthcare executive. As one of the women in the book put it, when I'm facing a challenge or a difficult decision, I always return to my original clinical focus point and consider what is in the best interest of my patients. Well, among the uh, many reviews for the book, uh, there was one in Forbes magazine. Uh, George Anders ended his review with this comment. If, women need, if medicine needs a roadmap that shows how female leaders can become more prominent roles, then lessons learned can be that book. And Claire Fraser, who is a PhD and the head of the Institute of Genomic uh, Medicine at the University of Maryland Medical School, and also one of the people who was responsible for the Human Genome Project, uh, read the book. And she sent me a note in which she said that uh, for her, the stories really resonated. But what she said struck her the most were the thoughts in the final words section. And she quoted this. The fact that doors to leadership in organized medicine have opened is only half the battle. Women have to be willing to walk through those doors. 
So I hope that those of you who have never considered taking on leadership roles in medicine will seriously consider it, and those of you who are already in mid-management will continue to aspire to more senior roles, because now has never been a better time for women leaders in medicine. The barriers remain, as I've said, you've heard them all, but I think that, we, that it's a much easier time to, to overcome them, especially if we walk through those doors together. So I know I, I finished my prepared talk a little bit earlier, but I wanted to uh, have time for a little bit of q and I always like to hear everybody else's stories. And also, there, as you heard, there will be an opportunity to, uh, to get the book uh, later. There's going to be, I guess, a book signing. But I wanted to let you know that all of the royalties go to medical research and also to an organization called uh, Remote Area Medicine, which provides uh, medical missions for underserved and underinsured Americans. And finally, I asked all of the women in the book who participated to provide their contact information, which is in the back of the book, but some of them are outdated as they've moved into other, or other positions like Aura. So um, if you have an interest in getting in touch with anyone who's profiled in the book, if you'll contact me, I'll, I'll try to help you make that introduction. So once again, thank you so much for coming to hear me speak. And Any thoughts, any questions? Testing, testing, testing. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Lanalee Sam. I'm here in Fort Lauderdale, and I had the good fortune of having been co-chair of the Women's Physicians Association for the Broward County Medical Association. I was just looking on your website, and I can't believe you're, like, in Boca. You're here. Um, <laughs> thanks for being such a, a leader for all of us, and one of the things that I believe in is the importance of we as women physicians supporting our leaders. So within your, within your realm at the moment here in Boca and nationally, is there anything that we, because we hold the keys to the empire right here that we can do for you? I've been pushing your, I took lots of pictures of you and I just threw it all out on Instagram and Physicians Mom Group with your website and your book. How, how can we help you? Do you want us to punt uh, executives in your direction that you're going to try to try to place? I've got a brilliant person that <laughs> needs uh, a Absolutely. chief uh, patient experience job. Yeah, I, I, well, that's fine. That's wonderful. But the other thing is that when you have an opportunity to have some influence in your organization for searches, Please make sure that, and I think I heard somebody saying that, that they were upset because there was a search for a um, department chair and no candidate, no female candidates were submitted. So I've seen this a lot. You know, and what I feel, one a part of my mission and one of the reasons that I did all this was to try to help more women get into these senior positions. But if the bias starts with the organization, that's a problem. So anything you can do to really influence your, your organizations as they do searches for for people in, in various positions. Make sure that they include women in, in the candidates because there's so many women who are talented out there who really should be moving up and uh, we should be really running the show. <laughs> Agreed. Hello, Lou Ann Thorndike from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. I have your book, I've read it. Thank you, I'm glad you're here. Your comments were wonderful. I wonder if you would please comment on the concepts of leadership and management and how you see them um, intersecting or differentiating. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean exactly. Leadership versus management. Well, I think that uh, a good leader is also a good manager, so I'm not sure that they don't intersect. But um, if you're talking about particular positions, I mean, you have to be a leader. If you're a manager, if you're a medical director, for example, or even associate medical director, whatever position you have, I think that thinking leadership and management in the same terms are probably, I don't think of them as In separate. your mind, they're one and the same then. Yeah, I do see that. Hi, is this one on? Probably not. Let me run. Come on. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I'm Paulette Cazares. I'm a commander uh, in the Navy, psychiatrist, and I'm out in San Diego. Uh, so, I know, when I got promoted to commander, my husband didn't like that one. <laughs> and my friends made t-shirts, and so anyways, it was. Uh, so uh, any 
military physicians in your book. I plan to get it, but uh, and have you had experience placing former military physicians? One of, the, go ahead. I haven't, but I've worked with other recruiters who have. So yeah, it just depends on the contract that the company, you know, that the organization. Usually, they have a particular search firm that they use. So one of the things that struck me is we actually do, you know, we have our challenges in the military, but uh, we have a lot of internal leadership development. And I have had on-the-job leadership training from, from day one. So uh, I actually am not very clinical at this point, mo probably about 70-30 uh, in management. And uh, I love it. One of the transitions that happened in my brain over time was this like betrayal of my uh, you know <laughs> initial plan and uh, leaving clinical medicine, the guilt, the guilt, the guilt. So I'm curious um, what you came across and with your stories with regards to that well, and that decision to right. switch. I mean that, that's something that a lot of the women in the book, including myself, have struggled with because when you go into clinical medicine, suddenly you are you know part of the management team or leadership, there is this sense as you say, of betrayal, not only your own sense of guilt, but also among other physicians. And they shouldn't see it that way. I think that we should see having physicians as leaders as being the right thing, you know, rather than having non-physicians as telling us what to do. So, um, <laughs> so again, I think this has a lot to do with support because you know, I do think that being a clinician first for me at least, and for most of the women except for one in the book, has really been very helpful and has, has given you the perspective to understand what it's like to be on the front lines. I mean, that, that in and of itself is something that non-physicians cannot appreciate. Um, but then understanding the language of business and understanding the language of, of, uh, of uh, health policy is, I think, critical. And they're not all mutually exclusive. So you can, you know, you can be a good clinician and you can deliver health care in a um, an efficient way and a cost-effective way, they don't have to be one or the other. And that's why I think doctors are the best at doing this. So I heard from one recruiter that when he hires or when he represents a woman, he ends up making less in the end because women don't negotiate their salary as well and he earns his business from how much the women negotiate for for their salaries. And so there was already then a bias that his, he, he would rather promote the men because at the end of the day, he makes more. Well, then he's not a good recruiter because it's really <laughs> good. I mean, the whole point of having somebody recruit for you is to be able to also help you learn how to negotiate or to negotiate for you. And I've never had a problem negotiating for higher salary for, because somebody was a woman or less salary because they were a woman. I have this light shining in my eyes, though. I'm sorry if I'm... Uh, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I'm a doctor of reproductive medicine, and I represent our organization at the United Nations. And even there, women are not accepted in the higher positions. And as you know, we don't have uh, deans more than 16%. So how is it that we cannot improve that ability to reach those heights? Well, as I say, I think that one of the biggest problems, in fact, one of the women in the book is from my medical school, the University of Maryland Medical School. And she said that, again, I was talking about searches. When they hired a search firm, the particular search firm did not bring in any female candidates for a number of the positions, <coughs> excuse me, into the school. So if you, don't, if you don't start out with bringing female candidates in, you're not going to be able to move them up. And I think that's very important. So I think there needs to be, that's why I talk about pushback. We need to insist that women are included uh, and not to assume that there are not plenty of talented, I know thousands of talented women out there who should be in higher positions. And we just need to push for that because there is, there's bias in the organizations, there's bias in the, you know, among, I mean, a lot of men you pe tend to hire people that they know or people that look like them. Yeah. And so we just have to say, you know, and we have to support each other. That's why I say we, we need to walk through these doors together. So I'm hoping you'll, Come home and you'll think about being leaders and you'll start screaming that we need more women. I haven't personally done that, but I mean, I'm always happy to talk to somebody about what I think that you should think about, but you know, that, that's a sort of a specialty in and of itself. I mean, how does it, today it's especially hard to start your own practice, so I wouldn't be the one to necessarily give you that advice. I might be able to refer you to someone who could do that for you. Okay. But yeah, I applaud you trying to do that today. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maria Phyllis. I'm a third year medical student at Johns Hopkins. Do you have any advice for medical students interested in um, 
with an eye towards medical management in their future career in terms of how they want to kind of shape and uh, formulate at this stage? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I've been mentoring a number of young women. I mean, some of the women in the book are even people that I worked with for years before I placed them at positions because I saw that they really had the ability. I thought they would be uh, terrific leaders. And so we talked over time about what their goals were and what they felt that they, they, needed, you know, they needed in terms of experience before they moved into certain positions. I'd start early to think about it and to try to find maybe people either in the book or other people that you know who will, will mentor you. And it doesn't have to be one, it should be more than one person, but someone that you can look at as a role model and kind of plan your career. But I, I think you do need to start early. Thank you. I'm Josephine May. I'm in a private practice in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. And most, a lot of the students in this room, I mean, their dream is to become a physician, and you have the letters MD afterwards. But I don't know that many people have the dream of being, getting an MBA afterwards. And so, you know, the first thing is clinical, and then it's administrative. Um, we talked about a little bit how sometimes it seems like going on to the other side is the dark side. Right. You know, and, um, <laughs> you know, and some of us are, um, reach that stage when you reach some period of burnout or disenchantment and looking at other opportunities besides patient care. And so I'd, uh, I wanted you to address kind of like that bridge or, you know, the opportunities if you, you know, didn't get the MBA or is that a necessary tool to do if you're yeah. thinking in that direction? Yeah, when I got my MBA it was because my boss at UCLA said, if you get an MBA, we'll pay for it. <laughs> and so I said, I'm not interested in medicine and I knew I wasn't at that point a very good negotiator, so I brought my husband, who I thought was a great negotiator, to talk to the dean. And by the time we finished talking to him, maybe two, three hours later, we were both enrolled in the MBA program. <laughs> um, but that was in 1988. There were very few physicians. There, were only one, there was only one other person in our class. And so we were unique in that sense, and, and that gave us a lot of opportunities to do other things. But I think today, that getting an MBA is really not necessary. It's more learning some of the language and some of the um, you know, finance, if you're interested in that. Those things you can even learn on your own. There's a lot of online courses now with Coursera. And um, I just took a great course from, I think it was Coursera from the University of Michigan on, on finance. So those are things you can learn on your own. So no, you don't need those degrees to be a manager because you have to have experience. And the experience is much more important. Thank you very much.